Big thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, Spirit of the Lie here. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at what's recently become clearly the best of the American civilizations in AoE 2, at least according to the stats. And that's the Incas. Thanks to some recent buffs to their bonuses and slinger, Incas have gone from pretty middle of the road to now top 10 on most open maps and at least average on every land map. While they're technically an infantry civilization, the reputation is more about being a flexible counter civ with great defenses. And whatever you throw at them, they always seem to have at least one or more often two good options to counter it. While this doesn't seem to translate well for the top 1% of players, for especially lower level and even intermediate players, this seems to be quite strong. In this video, we're going to go through their bonuses, tech tree, and surprisingly good unique units. Let's check them out. To start off with their team bonus, Incas and all of their allies start with a free llama. Chinese in particular benefit from this given the importance of getting all their villagers on food immediately, though any sieve is just going to have a smoother start, also delaying farms a bit longer. Another example where this bonus shines is on Mega Random or Nomad, where you aren't guaranteed a specific number of sheep or boar. Remember, small advantages early can echo later into the game, and it doesn't get any earlier than immediately starting with more food available. In fact, I would personally consider this one of the top 10, if not top 5, team bonuses in the game. Though one small note I should make is that while llamas used to have more line of sight than sheep and were then better at scouting, that is no longer the case. Moving on to their proper civ bonuses, the first is that their military units have an increasing food discount as you age up. This impacts many different units and is obviously helpful throughout the entire game. Even in the Dark Age, you already save 9 food per militia, increasing to something better than free supplies in Imperial Age for champions, and also offsets a recent increase in the food cost of Eagle Warriors. Even units you wouldn't immediately think of, like Petards, Genitours, and Shalotta Warriors are also affected. So basically anything except crossbows, monks, and siege give unusually good value. Don't underestimate how quickly this bonus adds up, and also keep in mind that food is the slowest of the resources for villagers to collect. Moving on, their next bonus is their villagers benefit from the infantry upgrades at the blacksmith, starting in Castle Age. Much like the Spanish supremacy tech, I see this mostly as a defensive bonus, making your villagers harder to raid. For example, they take 50% more attacks from Hazar than a generic civilization, and roughly double the number of arrows from a lot of archers and cavalry archers, while also doing up to 4 times as much damage in return if they actually end up fighting hand to hand. They're not as good as Spanish villagers, especially in terms of HP, but in one extreme example against elite skirmishers they go from taking 8 to taking 40 javelins, so in the right matchups their armor goes a long way. On the flip side, another obvious benefit is its offensive potential to help establish forward bases or castle drops. In Castle Age, they take these same 40 javelins from elite skirmishers and are just going to survive that extra bit longer against almost anything, including surviving a direct mangonel shot, which they're more likely to survive with a couple of HP left over. That's the kind of thing that can make the difference between getting a castle up successfully versus having it get stuck at 95% because all your forward villagers are taken out. Somewhat related to this, their next bonus is that their buildings cost 15% less stone. This saves 19 stone per tower, 98 stone per castle, 1 stone per wall segment, and even 15 stone per town center if you're booming. The synergy with stronger late game villagers is pretty obvious, as you're doubly incentivized to make aggressive castles. Of course, it's not as big of a discount as the Franks 25% cheaper castles per se, but again, it's very on brand for Incas that their bonus applies to multiple buildings, again, emphasizing flexibility. And finally, their last bonus also saves some resources, this time with houses supporting 10 population instead of 5. Theoretically, this could save up to nearly 500 wood throughout the game on top of about 8 minutes of building time, though I think most people would agree the value is more about convenience than total resources. Typically, players start with the usual two houses, though unlike other civilizations, after those two, you're probably set through the Dark Age. 
that's 50 wood saved right there, on top of 90 extra food from your llama, and 27 food saved on 3 militia. So while they're more subtle bonuses, their early advantages add up, and always give an unusually smooth start to the game. The one downside of their houses to mention is that if you don't have some extra houses as a buffer, you can actually get housed pretty quickly if they're being raised, as your pop cap drops by 10 instead of 5 with every house destroyed. So that's their bonuses, and between the extra llama, food discount, stone discount, and wood savings from houses, we already get the sense this is a civilization designed around flexibility. That said, when people talk about Incas as a counter-civilization, they're usually not talking about their bonuses, but more typically their unique units, which we'll take a look at now. We'll start with the Kamiak, which is their castle unique unit. Now, I recently made a video looking at them in depth, but to hit the highlights, the unit's strength doesn't really come from its stats, which on the face of it are comparable or even slightly worse than a longsword, while individually each unit costs more. Instead, its value mostly comes down to its extra one range, allowing them to almost always get an attack in first against enemy units, and also exploit pathing issues that exist in the game, getting every one of the Kamiaks involved in the fight faster while enemy units bump off of each other. Now, so far you might expect you need a very large group to see this effect, but as I found in that recent video, even 5 vs 5, they consistently win against longswords, who they otherwise lose to one on one. It is true in larger groups though, their advantage continues to grow, taking some very one-sided fights against generic infantry once you start getting 10 Kamiaks or more together. You can even do some rudimentary hit and run with that extra range, as they're actually faster than the swordsman line. Maybe the more impressive thing about the unit though, is thanks to a bonus against cavalry, they can beat knights with equal numbers, which differentiates them from pikemen, who actually lose to knights without a numbers advantage. The downside is they cost 30 gold per unit, and require castles to create, whereas of course pikes and halberdiers are from the barracks, and only cost food and wood. In fact, Incas in general can be quite gold intensive, but assuming you have the gold, the Kamiak is a strict upgrade over the pike line, especially once you can mass them. They even end up doing pretty well against archers in the late game after unique tech, taking about 50% more arrows than a champion, and around 3 times the arrows of a halberdier. I wouldn't say they counter archers and you'd want eagles in that situation, but anytime you need a meat shield against either infantry or cavalry, and especially if there's enemy archers around, the Kamiak is a great option. Now where Kamiaks can be thought of as the flexible answer to cavalry, their second unique unit is their answer to infantry. That brings us to the Slinger, which is the Inca's archery range unique unit. Again, I recently did a deep dive into this unit and walked away pretty impressed. Stats wise, it's nearly identical to the crossbow at first glance, though it does have a number of disadvantages, including the fact it can't be massed in feudal age like archers can, and they're also a bit worse to micro. Its main selling feature though, is that it has a plus 10 bonus against infantry, just like the hand cannoneer. This makes them a great option to deal with the increasing popularity of infantry units in castle age, but even in imperial age, their high accuracy and fast fire rate makes them at least as good as hand cannoneers against most infantry, while also being significantly cheaper. Given their similar cost, stats, and fire rate to crossbows, they actually end up performing similar to crossbows against knights, assuming you pick up their unique tech Andean Sling, which removes their minimum range and gives them plus one attack. In late castle age at least, that makes them roughly as dangerous to knights as a similar sized group of crossbows without thumbring. While they fare poorly in contrast against heavy cavalry in imperial age, after the unique tech fabric shields, they can actually win against arblesters with equal numbers, meaning they aren't totally useless against things outside of infantry. Of course, like any ranged unit, their hard counters are mostly skirmishers and especially mangonels and onagers, as slingers only have 40 HP. I should also reiterate as well, as it's not always intuitive, they are affected by the archer attack upgrades. Both of their unique techs are also quite important to the unit, and like archers, they're affected by ballistics, chemistry, and have their accuracy but not fire rate improved by thumbring. So personally, I consider thumbring by far their least important upgrade. Together, their unique units counter two of the basic unit types, with their eagle warrior functioning as a third option against archers, siege, and monks, completing the set. Now let's move on and talk about their unique techs, which do a nice job of enhancing these core units. The first is Andean Sling, which is quite cheap and recently became much more important. Its first effect is removing the minimum range of Slingers and Skirmishers, but recently gained a second effect of adding plus one attack to the Slinger, bringing it up to now match the crossbow. 
Situationally, that's helpful for skirmishers, but that new effect means this is basically a required tech if you're making slingers, to any reasonable extent, as given their low base attack, they're often largely negated by armor. So while it sounds small, that plus one can often mean 25, 50%, or even double the damage against enemy units. Though the blacksmith attack upgrades for archers give better value and are worth grabbing first. Following this, their other unique tech in Imperial Age is Fabric Shields, giving plus one, plus two armor to Kamiaks, Slingers, and Eagles. As mentioned earlier, this allows their Slingers to beat generic Arblasters one-on-one, -on -one, makes their Kamiaks much better against arrows than the Champion line, and also gives their elite Eagle Warriors up to 10 Pierce Armor, making them even more resistant to Arblasters than Mayan Eagle Warriors. Now, the tech is significantly more expensive than the equivalent upgrade at the Blacksmith, but if you're against an opponent making a lot of ranged units, then it's basically a must-grab tech if you can afford it. With that said, if you're relying instead on other units, or you're not worried about running into archers, I would see this as more optional, as the 600 gold cost is significant if you aren't making good use of it. So that's their unique unit and techs, with those two techs making your unique units and eagles that much more dangerous. Of course, their food discount means lots of their options, including trash units, give especially good value. And now let's move on and take a broader look at their tech tree options, starting with the archers. Right away, of course, you don't have cavalry archers, but other than that, it's a full tech tree if you treat the slinger as a hand cannoneer alternative. You also have potentially no minimum range on your fully upgraded and discounted skirmishers. So the only thing to knock is really that the crossbow line itself is totally generic. That means despite their flexibility, they're not ideal as an archer sieve in a 2v2 game, for example, but I'll still give them an A-, carried here by the slinger. They are often played as a crossbow sieve in 1v1 games, but I wouldn't quite consider their archery range top tier. Next up for infantry, you have fully upgraded halberdiers, champions just missing gambazins, and eagle warriors, all with their food costs discounted significantly. Their eagle warriors especially can be quite dangerous to archers in the late game, and throw in the Kamiak as an archer-resistant cavalry counter, and you have one of the most flexible infantry rosters. I'd give them another A- here, as the tools are definitely present, though I don't think the barracks alone completely carries them. They're really at their best when combining an archery range and infantry unit. Moving on to the stable, while they can't technically build one, they can convert one, unlocking the Shalotta Warrior. While it's an unupgradable knight, and technically would be an F here, it's arguably better than the Dravidian stable, in all honesty. Next up for Siege, you have Siege Engineers, and basically everything else you need. Bombard Cannon is always a nice option to have, but of course you don't have gunpowder, and there's also no relevant bonuses here, which holds them back. Still, I'd say it's a solid B, and the Siege Ram especially is a nice option in the late game, while Onagers with maxed out range are, again, all you usually need. Moving on now to the Navy, traditionally Incas have been pretty average on water according to the stats. You do have the house bonus, saving a bit of wood early, and cheaper stone costs can also help defend the shore, but you don't have a dedicated water bonus. They wouldn't be my first choice, and I'd say they're a pretty generic feeling C plus on water early. As for the late game, you have decent fast fire ships and galleons, and it'll be interesting to see if Incas eventually get the Dromen, or something comparable, as for right now, they're one of the only civilizations that will struggle to bombard the enemy shoreline. Again, there's a lot of civilizations I'd pick on water ahead of Incas, and I'd say they're just a B on water late, or a B minus navy overall. Taking a quick look now at the monks, lots of the good techs are here, though notably they're missing fervor and atonement. Fervor gives monks more speed, and Atonement lets you convert enemy monks, which isn't the most common situation, but if you end up running into an opponent that is also going for monks, that can be a headache. Given your lack of cavalry and high HP units, having at least redemption and block printing adds an important option against onagers in the late game, which Incas can otherwise struggle quite a bit against, and I'd say it's a B for monks. Moving on to defenses, this is definitely a strength of the civilization, for a few reasons. The obvious ones are the stone discount, letting you build an earlier castle, and your villagers having more armor and attack than usual. Having so many good counter units can also be great when you're on the back foot, and slingers for example can help you stabilize against anything from longswords to an infantry unique unit like the gabetto or chakram thrower. I'd say it's an A for defenses. And finally, to wrap up with the trash units, that is, units that don't cost any gold, you are missing Hazar, but the Halberdier and Elite Skirmisher are at least discounted to make up for that. 
While that does mean you're lacking a bit of raiding potential once gold runs out, I'd still give them a B-, and the stats seem to suggest that Inca's actually above average in 1v1 games lasting an hour or longer when gold starts to run out. Villagers being especially hard to raid can also be a very nice bonus in those particularly long games. So to give some closing thoughts, as we've seen repeatedly, Incas are a very gold dependent but extremely flexible civilization. In the early game, given your lack of cavalry, they can really be played as infantry or archers, or sometimes as a combination of the two. Both are common, and either way you have a couple of bonuses helping you out against aggressive civs on open maps. While it's definitely less popular these days, a tower rush can also be a reasonable choice, given your tower discount, and remember any forward villagers you have when you hit castle age will instantly benefit from the extra armor you might have picked up for infantry. Generally, in the mid game though, they're most commonly played as a crossbow civilization, though mixing in a few counter units like skirmishers or eagles against archer civs or slingers against infantry always feels very natural. As for the Imperial Age, the most popular units tend to be Arbalesters, Eagles, Slingers, and Kamiex, largely depending on your opponent's strategy. Keep in mind that's also when your food discount really starts to shine, increasing to 30%, letting you take some really cost-effective engagements. But speaking of being efficient with your food costs, big thanks to this video's sponsor, HelloFresh. As you may know already, HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that brings all the ingredients you need in exactly the right proportions to your door, taking the hassle out of dinner. You just pick from 40 recipes each week and they'll send you what you need to make them. No worries if you aren't a pro in the kitchen, as HelloFresh has foolproof recipes that are pre-portioned and easy to prepare with clear instructions including pictures. For example, on this week's menu you can find a zesty salmon over creamy fresh linguine that takes just 20 minutes to prepare. Or for any vegetarians out there, you could have cheesy lentil nachos with lime crema and guac. Instead of buying 12 different ingredients and having awkward amounts left over, they send just the amounts you need. Now I hear your concern, what about all the package waste and carbon footprint? Well, I looked up the numbers, and in fact, a University of Michigan study found that meal kits like HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients not only result in less food waste, but also cut down on your carbon footprint compared to grocery shopping for the same items. Personally, I'm trying to be more mindful of sodium and to go more vegetarian these days, and was glad to see that HelloFresh's website lets you filter recipes for things like vegetarian, low-calorie, low-carb, and quick to prepare, with a nutritional breakdown for each recipe. It's a great way to commit to spending more time in the kitchen this summer using fresh ingredients and expanding your meal variety, while being significantly cheaper and healthier than eating out. The best part is if you're in the continental United States, you can use my link or go to hellofresh.com and use code POGSPIRITMAY16 to get 16 free meals plus free shipping. So hopefully this was a helpful look at the Incas and gives you a few new ideas for the next time you try them. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.